Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Heath, and I'm a volunteer with the Authors at Google team. If you like this program and you're not already involved and would like to be, please feel free to talk to me. We're always looking for more volunteers. Today we've got two great speakers who are going to talk as well as show some of their work to us today. We have Jonathan Ames and Dean Haspiel. Jonathan Ames is the author of I Pass Like Night, The Extra Man, What Not to Love, and My Less Than Secret Life. He's the winner of a Guggenheim Fellowship for Prose, but also an unsuccessful amateur boxer. He contributes frequently to Public Radio International, and he's been on Late Night with David Letterman. Dean Haspiel I've known for more time than Jonathan. Jonathan I just met today. Uh, Dean is the creator of the Eisner Award-nominated Billy Dogma and is a co-founder of the webcomics collective Activate. He's drawn superheroes for Marvel and DC Comics and has worked with Pulitzer Prize-winning Michael Shabun on The Escapist. He's also worked with Harvey Picard on American Splendor and The Quitter, um, both people behind books that if you haven't read them, you should. They're here today to talk about a book they worked on together called The Alcoholic, which was published by Vertigo uh, last year. Jonathan Ames and Dean Haspiel. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you, Google, for having us. Um, what we're going to do is uh, just, I'll read a little bit from The Alcoholic, and you'll see the images. And, uh, and on these seats, it does feel like, I don't know, feels like school in a nice way, though. You know, like, like this is like an awesome, super advanced high school. Um, so <clears throat> uh, why don't we go to the, and then after I read a little bit and you see the images, then we'll do a, a Q&A, any questions you might have about how we collaborated, uh, writer and illustrator of a graphic novel, and, and like that. So, um, Dean, if we could see the first page. Okay. okay. <clears throat> um, just to establish this a little bit, um, the, the narrator of the book and the protagonist is a fellow named Jonathan A. Uh, it's a work of fiction, but I did draw upon myself, and Dean literally drew upon me, uh, for the character. Uh, a could stand, for, well, that might come up later, but alone or anonymous or... Um, I was going to say upset, but that doesn't begin with A. But anyway, it's, it's Kafka-esque, Jonathan A. And uh, he has a little bit of trouble with uh, drugs and alcohol, and he writes mystery fiction. And uh, so we begin on uh, the morning of September 10th after he's had a binge. And that night of September 10th, 2001, he has to give a reading at Barnes & Noble. So I'll just jump in now, top left corner. I got up around noon and wasn't feeling too bad. That night, September 10th, I had a reading at the Barnes & Noble on 6th Avenue in Manhattan. My novel, The Music That Kills, had just come out in paperback. I did a drawing of my balding pattern, a sort of diagram that I would hand out at the reading. Then I'm at Barnes & Noble. Please welcome Jonathan A., says the woman at Barnes & Noble. I scanned the crowd looking for Sal in Seattle. Of course, neither of them was there. Sal was his childhood friend whom he had been separated from for a long time, and he always had this wish wherever he went to see Sal again. Maybe Sal might show up. And Seattle was the name of his girlfriend. She had moved to Seattle, but her name had become too painful for him, so he called her by whatever city she went, was living in at that time. <laughs> And he also had this insane hope, even though she was in Seattle, that maybe she might be at a reading in New York, always looking for her, longing for her. <clears throat> so then now Jonathan speaking to the audience while holding up a bald, uh, the balding diagram, which is a drawing I actually did. It's kind of my Hitchcock cameo moment in a graphic novel because I do doodle myself. And years ago when I was first going bald, way back when, um, I used to have this line of hair at the front that I called the fringe or the hedge. It was a ridiculous kind of comb over attempt that I would comb back over my head like filaments, you know? And, um, and I would hand out this diagram at readings because I didn't want people to think that I didn't know I was going bald. You know, I didn't want them to be like, oh, poor guy's going bald. So I'd hand out this diagram to cut that off right at the start. And I set it up like a map showing the areas where the hair was strong and weak and stuff like that. And it had a legend on the side. So, so here he is speaking, probably the very same thing I just set up. Anyway, I'll say it again. 
I didn't want anyone to think that I wasn't aware that I was going bald, so I made this diagram of my balding pattern. It's kind of set up like a map, with a topographical legend on the side. I've made a hundred copies. I'll hand them out. Next page. So here he is still talking. To mix things up, I thought that rather than read from my novel, I would read this essay I wrote a few years ago. It's relevant to what I've been going through lately. I want to say by way of introduction to the essay that I have found that the world is divided between those who like scatological humor and those who don't. For those of you who don't, please see this essay as a story of hubris, an excess of pride. And for those of you who like scatological humor, I will now read, I Shit My Pants in the South of France. I read then this story of how when I was 19, I went to the South of France with a friend from Yale. We were there to take a French course. One night I was very drunk and bought a tuna fish sandwich from a clouchard, which is French for bum. I bought it right off his hand where it was resting sans napkin. I know this is Google, but for those of you who don't speak French, that's without napkin. So a tuna fish sandwich was on his hand without a napkin, and in real life I actually did buy it. <clears throat> it was late at night. All the cafes were closed. After five minutes in my system, that sandwich exploded. We were racing back into town where we hoped one cafe was still open. I'm not going to make it. I don't know if we have another page. Do we? Okay. All right. And here's Dean's cameo. He drew himself in this moment. Maybe if we stop running. Stopping was, as bad, was a bad mistake. As soon as we stop running... I shat in my pants. For some reason, I said shat. I had never used the past tense before. I hid my underwear beneath a parked Peugeot. Then the French taxi driver. We get in a cab after all, even though we didn't have money. And he says, you shit in my car like a dog. And he kicked me out. Um, I don't, I think it ends there, right? What's the next page? No, no, no. no. Um, I don't think we should keep reading that, but, well, anyway, but that really did happen to me in the south of France. I don't mean to get scatological, and then the guy kicked me out of his cab and told all the other cab drivers what I had done, you know, and, uh, and it was humiliating in front of all these other cab drivers. So that's one little excerpt, kind of a, a nasty one, I apologize, but, you know, humorous, perhaps. Um, all right, let's go to the next thing. Um, you want to keep skipping ahead, or more? To the, you know, the girls' school? Um, I don't know. Let's find Monica Lewinsky, maybe. Do you want to go to that? Okay, yeah, let's read that section. Okay. okay. Here, here the, the, uh, Jonathan A. is giving a reading at KGB, a, a fundraiser. Um, he had gone to a teach at an all-girls school shortly after 9-11, the character, and then uh, he got kicked out of there because he got he misbehaved. And so now he's back in New York, giving a reading at a fundraiser. A few days after I got back, I was part of a large group reading. It was to raise money for several of the decimated New York City firehouses. Back then, there were many such fundraisers. I don't mean to make light of the whole thing. The book takes it quite seriously. But Monica Lewinsky was friends with one of the other writers, and so she was there. It was very nerve-wracking to read for her. After Clinton himself, she was the most famous person I had ever been around. She's kind of the American Princess Diana. Uh, after, right after 9-11, which happened to me and happened to the character as well, Clinton was walking the streets hugging people, and I was there, and I got to shake his hand, and I asked him, what should we do, Mr. President? And he gave me a long answer and held on to my hand, and it was amazing. Anyway, so back to the panel. So then the character's talking to Monica. It's very nice to meet you. I have one of your books by my bed, but I haven't started it yet. It was so strange that I had met Clinton, and now I was meeting Monica Lewinsky, and she had one of my books by her bed. I was flattered. I tried not to, but I couldn't help myself. I stared at her mouth. We chose the most outrageous sections, but I, you're all adults here. <clears throat> you coming to dinner? We're all going to this place I haven't heard of called Veselka. Sure, I love Veselka. It's Ukrainian. I wanted to tell her my Clinton story, to let her know that I understood firsthand his massive charisma and that I empathize, but I didn't think it would be appropriate. <clears throat> A bunch of us went out to dinner. We all made small talk, but I knew that we were all very aware of Monica. That was a great reading, really good crowd. We raised about $500. 
but really we're all just looking at her, thinking about her. This young woman had changed the course of history. Without Monica, Al Gore most likely would have won by an even larger margin in 2000. I love what Gore said at some point, quote, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and sometimes something else happens. That third, option seem, that third option seems to be the course that most often prevails in life. Then food arrived to the person next to Monica, and it was a kielbasa. And we'll just read one more page. <laughs> What's that? That looks delicious, says Monica. When she said the kielbasa looked delicious, it was like all sound drained out of the very noisy restaurant. <laughs> the whole table went into collective shock. I astrally projected myself onto the ceiling to survive. It was all so wildly embarrassing. We all thought the same thing. Monica thinks that a penis looks delicious. I love the food here. When's the next fundraiser? My pierogies are cold. But we all pretended that nothing happened. I nevertheless continued to astrally project myself. I'm very codependent and felt terrible for poor Monica. So I guess that's all we'll read, and uh, so that's a little sample from our, our graphic novel, The Alcoholic. And thank you, Dean, for doing all that, and thank you for, I hope, I didn't mean to offend anyone with any of that material, uh, that's not the intent. If you read the book in its entirety, you know, maybe it will be a little less offensive. <laughs> so, um, okay, so now we'll, we'll open it up to questions. Sure. That was, uh, I was not offended, personally. Um, as far as uh, collaborating, how far along does the narrative have to be developed before you begin illustrating? Is it sort of like, because I imagine if you're sort of, it's, it's a first draft and you start illustrating, and you're like, oh, you know what, I'm going to rewrite it, and then you'd have to change a bunch of the illustration. So is it sort of in a manuscript form, fairly finalized, and then, and then the illustration begins? Or is it sort of, are you guys working in collaboration all along on the narrative as well? You want me to answer? <laughs> well, I, you can answer, but basically, uh, Jonathan wrote the whole story uh, first. And maybe, was I halfway through when maybe you added another 10 or 12 pages? Or not added, but expanded on, maybe, perhaps? Um, I don't remember the, the, the exact details behind yeah. that. But he had the whole story laid out. Right. Uh, and then uh, I, I started drawing from page one. And, he, and Jonathan had never written a comic book before, but he had knocked it out of the ballpark. Uh, there are a lot of writers today that work in film industry or uh, authors, right. you know, write novel, literary, and they're all trying their hand at comics, and believe it or not, it's really hard to write a comic book, uh, especially because you're dealing with static images and the beats between pages right. and all that stuff, uh, and especially if you're not a visual person, uh, I think a lot of writers tend to overwrite, let's say, but uh, Jonathan is just a renaissance yeah. man. This guy can, it seems anything he tackles, he does very well. Uh, cool. So I would say... It was like 95% there, and then with you know tweaks here and there along right. the way. Right. Um, and did you have any kind of modifications when I was drawing it? Um, well, yeah. I mean, essentially, to answer your question, it wasn't like, oh, here's the first 10 pages, draw, and then, he, you know, it was like the book was done, uh, the editor approved it. Okay, that's what I was... So you had been like several drafts through the book and it was fairly finalized, and then yeah, you was, handed it off as opposed to like handing off an early draft of it. Right, a, it was right. completely finalized. Okay. Dean started drawing, and uh, you know maybe I may have um, knowing that he hadn't gotten to the end yet. Maybe I had a new idea, and so I may have changed a page or two. Right. But he he got a finalized thing, and then he started working. Then other people might have questions about the process once he started working. Um, but yeah, it's a final draft. Then he goes. So it's like a baton is passed. Got it. Thanks. <coughs> Anybody else here a comic book fan? Do y'all read comics? Um, if, if there are no questions, go, you, you, want, you can go to the mic or ask from there. I, mean, I think we could all hear. I'm projecting because I trained in a Shakespearean theater. No. <laughs> <laughs> what level of direction did you give um, per panel? Or <clears throat> um, uh, A fair amount of, like, just so you know, just to explain a little bit for those of you who don't know, um, how to about the scripts for a graphic novel or comic book. Uh, for every page, 
for the most part, the author, if, if it's a writer and illustrator, determines how many panels on each page and then I would describe what I wanted in the panel. Sometimes my descriptions might be more detailed or intent. Other times I might leave it more vague and just be like, Jonathan running down the street. And then I knew Dean would provide his amazing skills and talent. Other times I might be like, Jonathan's head is down. You know what I mean? It would get more specific if I needed it to be more specific. So in each panel, I would describe what I wanted. Um, and then... Um, and Dean would follow that and then sometimes he might email me or be like I kind of want to try this panel this way or if I had five panels and then he'd be like you know what I think this page would work better for four I'm gonna make one of the panels floating so it was very collaborative that way but he, he would he used my script as the jumping off point and then for many pages followed it very closely and then other pages he would you know take his own tack. And also because the alcoholic is a very emotional uh, story, and then John was very aware at times in description, like to be you know to show the emotions here or, or pull back and let me do action. At one point, Jonathan admitted to me that because parts of this of the comic are very heavy, it would be like a scene that would get a little heavy, and then just to throw something back my way to have some fun, he would throw like a fun scene in there. <laughs> so it goes back and forth between like being kind of deep and and sad at times to being very funny, and you know like life. You know, uh, so but yeah, I, I think basically Jonathan just trusted me as a cartoonist for doing this so, so many years to rely on the fact that I would design a page a certain way to make each page uh, have the the maximum impact for what he was going for. And also, I showed layouts uh, that would get approved like until that. finally I was just going to pencils uh, without showing the storytelling because uh, basically Jonathan and the editor Jonathan Vankin. Uh, trusted my sensibilities, and maybe there were a couple times where I had to change something. Yeah. Like when Dean says he would do like layouts, he would do like maybe in his sketchbook or something, like his rough idea of, of his interpretation of mm -hmm. my directions, and I'd be like, yeah, that looks good. You know, this character's moving that way, and you know, and and you maybe the character would be like that, but it was very like kind of sketchy. And then um, the next stage would be then Dean would do pencils. Um, and then scan it and email it to me and to the editor. And I'd be like, yeah, that looks great. Because then the next stage is to ink it, which finalizes it. Um, and then every now and then, like, I, the one time I most recall is, like, Dean had the character leering at a woman. And I was like, no, 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 he's sweet in that moment. You know, we got to keep him sympathetic. So I was like, no leering, sweet look. You know what I mean? Maybe leer underneath. But um, <clears throat> so, you know, for the most part, though, because also my my directions were pretty explicit. Um, he always, you know, and a lot of time it was really beautiful, like, because if I was describing things I saw in my mind or things from my life, I would describe them and then he would recreate them almost as if he had seen a photograph, which was cool. So I think... Um, I remember at one point you, you emailed me or called me and you're like, this is haunting some of it. Yeah. How it seemed to be accurate to what he was, uh, Jonathan was imagining uh, things would look like. And I think it's also because, you know, we're approximately the same age. Uh, we both live in Brooklyn. We've been friends for many years now. So I think I also have heard enough stories from Jonathan that it made the collaboration even stronger to be real good friends uh, and to have lived maybe a parallel universe version of some of this story myself. So, like I Dean is the Bizarro version of me. Those of you who know, like uh, DC, is that yeah, DC? It's a DC character. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm cooler than you that. know the upside down world. Like right. I'm like a hero. He He's an anti-hero. You know, right? Like I, I'm bald. He has hair. No, I don't know. So, well, another question, or, or and you could come back if you like. So, and thanks for coming. Um, I, believe it or not, read my first graphic novel less than two years ago, and I've completely fallen in love with the medium. Um, I believe I can write just a little bit, but completely intimidated by the illustration part of it. So is there a way for people who have uh, no expression in that medium to actually get started with a very, very basic draft? Uh, to, you mean for new writers who are coming to comic book, the, the, the forum, uh, how, how do you start type thing? I just had got an email actually from someone who uh, was asking, uh, or was actually uh, 
bummed out because she <laughs> wants to be, I have a studio in Gowanus, <laughs> Brooklyn, and she wanted to be, somehow be an intern there, but she's like, I can't draw, I don't know Photoshop, I have no skills beyond the fact that I can write. And I was like, well, that's a shame. That's okay. You know, writing is great, obviously. I mean, that's the first thing that, you know, gets, that's how you start this medium. Uh, but uh, I said to her, you know, there's so many artists out there that don't know how to write, you know, and, but do know how to visualize or do know storytelling tricks and techniques. And really what it comes down to is that collaboration, that marriage between text and image. That's what makes comics. Uh, so... What my, my advice to you is, is what you can show, you know, show that. And, and if you have to describe it, you know, in a description so that the artist can, can visualize that, that's how you begin writing comics. In fact, I went to film school and started uh, at SUNY Purchase and learned how to write screenplays and, and use that format. And for many, many years, I was using the screenplay format to write my comics. And it wasn't until recently with doing Billy Dogma for Activate that I started to actually just draw the ideas first and let the dialogue or the text come second. Because what, what I was realizing was that supports the images. Because comics is first a visual medium. Uh, and the difference between like comics and movies is that movies is moving images and sound, whereas uh, comics are static images that impact each other. Uh, so for you as a writer, just think about what you want to see and what you want to show. And then let the dialogue and the script come second, in a way. And then that will then marry itself and become just as powerful and potent. Yeah. Have you seen um, comic scripts, just so you could get an idea of the format? No, I haven't, actually. So these are um, separate uh, individual scripts for each comic that I can go into? You can look online. Honestly, you can type in X-Men script, and I mean, honestly, oh, you'll, okay. you'll find something. Yeah, because it'd be cool to see like how the scripts are written, then you could write a script, and then somehow plugging into Dean's comic book world, you know, through the internet or go to like comic book stuff. Hopefully, you could meet an artist that would respond to your work, and then you could give them the script and they could start producing it. Like, I think just, you know, hooking into Dean's world of these web comics. And, but the first step, I think, would be, I mean, and unlike movie scripts, um, I read a couple of comic scripts so I could get a sense of it. And every writer does it a little bit differently. But it's, and whereas movie scripts is very, you know, they're all the same uh, format. But comic scripts is literally like page one. And then you're like, I think like four panels would be good. You know, because you read comics or you read graphic novels. And like, I, all I did was just, you know, it's like pattern recognition, right? And I was like, I looked at other people's graphic novels. And I was like, okay, generally speaking, every page is four to five panels. You know, but like with all art, you want to change the rhythm. So every now and then, like have two panels or, you know, one panel. You know what I mean? Mix it up. And uh, but even even to, to jump on that, like a splash page sometimes is the equivalent of a close up or a vista. <clears throat> and the splash page is one big panel. Uh, so it really is about the beats per page. <clears throat> and, and to me, I like to work in what's, what I consider mini cliffhangers. You want to get to the end of a page especially if it's on the right side of the comic, and you want to make sure that that person's going to turn that page because they care. So sometimes you might ask a question that can only be answered on the next page. So there are all these little tricks you can use that makes, you know, fully realizes the comic book experience. Yeah, but, you know, look at some scripts, then think of the stories you want to tell, and then, you know, and the scripts aren't that formalized because literally it's like page one, panel one, and then you write your description, and if there's dialogue, then you write the person's name and the dialogue and the other person's name. And the one trick um, is, especially as Dean said, it's a visual medium. You have to keep the language to a minimum, at least the dialogue. And if there's any like voiceover or narration, um, you can, you know, you can write a fair amount for the description of what you want drawn because that'll never be seen. But for like for the voiceover and the dialogue, you got to keep, you know, it has to be terse um, because you don't have that much room in these boxes and you want the art to dominate as much as possible. And you have to rely on the art to be <coughs> contextual. So just trust that and know that that's also a huge part of the writing is the art. Wait, what do you mean contextual? Uh, well, what I mean is there's a lot of context in the art. That, mm -hmm. that there's a lot of story happening, mm -hmm. written, that's actually being drawn. Right. I mean, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Believe in that. Trust that. But the main thing is, like with any anything, is 
look at these scripts, get a hang of how other people have done it, like, and then, you know, and then, then, you know, it's like studying, you know, a painting and be like, okay, this is what I can do with a painting or, you know, like that. If you're looking for a really good example of a comic that also teaches, uh, recently DC put out something called All-Star Superman, written by Grant Morrison and drawn by Frank Whiteley. And it's a, a fantastic, entertaining comic. Uh, it's, there's two uh, collections at, uh, of 12 issues. And as I was reading it, I was also learning. And I mean, I've been doing this for so many years, and I'm still learning the medium. Uh, but take a look at that, because that was a perfect marriage of writer and artist doing something incredible. And the so, scripts are available online? I, I know that people have gone through, through a stone at Google and, you know, uh, got some scripts on there. I mean, pe- mm. you know what it is? A lot of artists are, uh, don't even know what, a, a, what I'll call a franchise script looks like, DC and Marvel and, and, and other publishers that work with these, you know, 50-year-old icons or 60-year-old icons like Batman. And there are scripts available that people put up online just so you know what these things look like. And again, like Jonathan said, everyone has a different solution of how to write. Uh, but there are some basic tenets that people use Page one, panel one. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Um, I was I was wondering, like, when you when you craft um, words that fit on a panel, do you ever think about like timing, like actual like real world timing? Because I, I always remember like seeing these these ridiculous comic strips where like someone's falling from a building. They're like, oh my god, I'm falling from a building. They say, you know, like first of all. It, they'd probably be dead before they... That, that's even, bad comic book writing. Yes. <laughs> a man I mean, walks through a door and it that, uh, says a man walks through a door. You, that's like, yeah. you know, you want to know what he's thinking. Maybe, yeah. What is, is this something that uh, that people, like, pay attention to? Like, actual, like, real-world timings? I, um, I, <clears throat> well, I, I know for me, um, I always, with everything I write, I try to have a certain level of verisimilitude. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So it's like if you... Ha, if you're writing a therapy session, yeah. maybe you just show like the first minute and then you cut mm-hmm. to 45 minutes later. So it's, it's not like three yeah. panels as a therapy session. <laughs> yes. Or if you're shooting a TV yeah. show or movie, you know what I mean? Therapy session is 50 minutes. Not that I would know, but mm-hmm. um, <laughs> no, I do know. <coughs> um, but I do it on the phone once in a while. Anyway, yeah, so I, I think at least I try to pay attention to having it be realistic. Certainly with comics, though. I mean, in comic books and superhero stuff, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's totally nutty and the laws of the universe have changed, you know. It's, it's just a pacing issue. I mean, you can mm-hmm. definitely indulge uh, reality or, you know, real time and space. Uh, and then that's why you cut away to stuff to maybe, you know, contrast that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, that's done all the time in comics. In fact, I picked up an issue, a superhero comic, speaking of superheroes, where the villain and the superhero talked for 20 pages. I was a little <laughs> stunned by that uh, over a desk. Uh, but I don't think that had happened in a while. I mean, most of the time they're throwing fists at each other, you know, so that was a, a different... So, uh, my Dinner with Andre, the uh, comic book. Say that again? Uh, my Dinner with Andre, the comic book. Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you both for coming to Google. I actually have a specific writing question. Jonathan, I've seen you speak a couple of times. I actually have not read um, any of your work yet. Mm -hmm. Um, But it seems to me that um, in in your self, you know, kind of semi-autobiographical, autobiographical autobiographical pursuit, that um, you seem pretty intertwined with your writing in that, like, every time you kind of have a humiliating or eviscerating experience, do you actually, like, stop and think, like, this would be great to put down on paper, or do you need actual distance between kind of your experiences and kind of the hu- humor that you're able to kind of extract from it? Did you like, say eviscerating? Yeah. <laughs> like, it seems, I mean, every time I've seen you talk, like, it's everybody, you know, you have the room in tears, you know, both from laughter and just also kind of the experiences that you talk about. And I'm wondering how much distance do you actually put between yourself? And, and the things that you experience and the actual, like, putting it down on paper. Yeah. Um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess at different times in my life, I've, I've, well, I used to write a column for a newspaper for about two and a half, three years uh, for the New York Press 
in the late 90s, um, kind of at the very end of um, alternative newspapers kind of impact in the culture in a way, because uh, very shortly thereafter, I do think blogs and the uh, internet did take away, like, because people still used to wait for the New York press to come out once a week because you'd hear these really weird writers that because it was a free paper, we probably couldn't write anywhere else and you could just say what you wanted, kind of the way the blogs do now, but obviously in much quicker, shorter doses. But so I used to write this column and I had to like kind of closely observe my life because every two weeks I had to basically put out an adventure. Um, and so I would sometimes draw upon the past. And usually if it was something humiliating or eviscerating or embarrassing, I usually did need some distance from it where I was kind of over it. And so if the world knew, I wouldn't be embarrassed anymore. Things that were more recent, I might hide or hold on to. Um, and so, yeah, oftentimes it was something I had gotten over already um, and didn't have quite the level of normal shame that a person should have for whatever reason. I don't know why. We all have our different blind spots, weaknesses, or strengths, but mine was not to be too ashamed of certain things. But I usually needed like a five-year period sometimes, or at least a two-year period. Then when I stopped writing the column, because I was kind of sick of observing myself so much, um, I was writing, I, I, I wrote a novel, and I haven't quite really been that autobiographical since. Um, though sometimes I still am... Um, but yeah, I mean, Philip Roth just once said about being a writer, he said that he hated going to funerals because he couldn't turn his brain off because he was listening for dialogue because a funeral, so much is going on, you know, about life and drama, but he sometimes wished he could just be there to mourn and not be the writer with the recorder on. So I don't know if that somewhat answers your question. Thanks. Appreciate it. You're welcome. I also, I found uh, a lot of that writing, what attracted me to Jonathan's writing was that revelation, uh, those embarrassing moments, it's oddly endearing. Uh, I don't know if any of y'all saw uh, Eminem's Eight Mile movie, but uh, it's basically about rappers who kind of like uh, battle each other with raps, and uh, so much terrible things were happening in his real life, and that instead of posing and voguing at the final, at the end of the movie, he basically raps about how terrible his life is and all, all the bad feelings he had. And then at that point, it gave him strength. It gave him, like, you can't touch me. I've already revealed. You can't diss me. You can't hurt me. If I'm going to just re reveal myself like that, I can be as open as possible. And I think it's a really endearing thing to be able to share uh, these embarrassing you know, moments. And I think it connects us all in some way. I mean, we're not all knights in shining armor, you know? So... Um, as an addendum to that, um, oh, I had two thoughts. Well, one is, um, oh, I lost one of them, but uh, with that clang, my brain shut down. Um, <laughs> oh, I don't know what's happening. Um, so one of them is, though, that as I've gotten older, though, um, it's been more difficult for me necessarily to reveal myself. Like, I don't mind strangers knowing about me, oddly enough, but it's more like the people closer to my life so I thought of my next book title might be, if you know me, please don't read this. You know what I mean? Like, just, just don't. Like, just love me for who I am. And Because in the writing, I might say things that will upset you or reveal secrets. But I don't mind strangers knowing, you know? Um, so there's that. I had another thought, but it, it got <laughs> scared away. I have two questions, one for Jonathan and one for Dean. Jonathan, um, the secret origin behind this book, were you a comics reader who always wanted to do a comic or did someone approach you or how did you kind of kick off with the project? And then I'll ask my second one next. Okay. Um, I, I had been a comics reader as a teenager, but then I had stopped around age 15 for whatever reason. Um, and then, you know, maybe occasionally I might see a comic or I read Mouse by Art Spiegelman, which I love, but I wasn't uh, something I was into. But then I met Dean uh, in, I think, 2000 or 2001, and we became friends. And he, very early on, began to say to me, we should collaborate, we should collaborate, let's do something together. 
I really like your work. Um, I could see Jonathan's stories every time I read them. Right. And I wanted to draw them. Yeah, and so... We had actually toyed with maybe me, at one point, maybe visualizing some of your pre-existing stories. Yeah, because I, what... I thought of the thing at the other addendum thing, it just came back to me. In terms of telling embarrassing stories about oneself, it kind of, for the most part, and then I'll get back to that question, is that I, um, I do like to be funny, but I, never, I don't like to make fun of other people. That's why I was very careful, like with the Monica Lewinsky, I was sympathetic to her, but that really did happen. So I didn't want to, I, try, I don't really want to hurt anyone else or mock anyone else. So that's why I've used myself as, uh, as the subject. Um, so just going back to your question, um, yeah, Dean approached me, kept saying, let's collaborate. And I, what came to my mind was when I would see um, R. Crumb's illustrations for uh, Charles Bukowski stories sometimes, or, you know, and I was like, oh, that's so cool, like you're reading a Bukowski story, and then here's this wild R. Crumb drawing. I, I don't know if those are familiar with either of those people, but I really love both their work. So... Um, so then Dean kept saying, let's collaborate, let's collaborate. And then finally one day uh, I said, okay. And he brought me to DC Comics just to explore it with the editor. And then over lunch with the editor, I kind of had, I don't know, just a little bit, I guess a brainstorm uh, of like a six-part adult comic that would come out once a month about an alcoholic on a bender. And that each episode would end in a cliffhanger. Like, what's happening? What's going to happen to the alcoholic next? You know, like, there he is hanging from a fire escaper. There he is running down the street in his boxer shorts or, you know, you know, <laughs> whatever an alcoholic might get up to. And I just thought it'd be funny and adult. And he had been set off on this bender by a heartbreak. Um, and it was, that idea was partly inspired because Dean had given me a comic to try to get me back into the world of comics. Uh, this comic called Why the Last Man which I enjoyed, and that's about the whole, all of men have been killed, but there's one man left on the planet for whatever reason, and women, uh, some sort of disease hit, and, uh, and each issue ended in a cliffhanger, like, what's going to happen to this last man? And I was like, I was like, Dean, do you have another issue? Like, you know, because I love the cliffhanger thing. I was getting back into comics like a kid. So that's where I came up with this idea of a six-part alcoholic bender cliffhanger, Perils of Pauline, and, but then DC was like, well, you're kind of known as a novelist. I don't think people would, your people won't know about going out to a comic book store to get a monthly comic. Why don't you take that idea and write a graphic novel? So that's how it all happened. Um, maybe it was like 2005. I may have gone with Dean to DC, then wrote up a proposal. They didn't go for it right away, changed it. And then I started writing it in June of 2006, finished it, worked on it off and on until December 2006. Then Dean started drawing February 2007, took him a whole year to draw it. And I'm just going longer here. But, and, then, um, and then every two weeks he would, like we talked about, send the drawings. from the, for the He would do 10 pages at a time to be on a schedule. And then I would check to make sure it matched with the script or give him feedback. And so then he drew for a whole year, February 2007 to February 2008. And then it came out September 2008. Would, so. you, would you do another one? Um, would I do another one? Um, <laughs> oh, God. I feel like oh, it's oh, like God. a furnace back there or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I would do another one. I've got so many projects going on at the moment. Um, and, but I'd like to try it again. Dean and I should, at some point when things calm down for me a little bit, I should think about like what would be a fun one to do. Um, We've been collaborating since, though, with your yeah. new book, your show. Yeah, well, Dean uh, has some drawings in my, uh, I have a new collection of fiction and essays coming out. So kind of our original notion of Dean illustrating some things, like he illustrated one of the essays in my piece is like an email that has a story in it, and Dean did a drawing to bring what happens in the email to life. Another, I participate in the six-word memoir thing. Um, you're only allowed to write six words, and I was asked to write a six-word memoir about heartbreak. So I came up with two, or not heartbreak, or just relationships, and I wrote one, uh, it's, like my, it's like my heart has sciatica, is that it? So then Dean did a drawing for that, and my other six-word memoir was on relationships. All my relationships end in pain, so he did a drawing for that. So that'll be in the new book. And then I, I wrote a TV show um, 
uh, called Bored to Death uh, for HBO. Sorry to sound so self-promotional, but I based a character on Dean, um, who's an illustrator, and uh, played by the comedian Zach Galifianakis. Those of you who might know Zach, he's a great YouTube person, but really talented. And so we see one of Zach, or the character's name is Ray, uh, we see one of Ray's drawings, and Dean did the drawings. So, and we and we're going to hopefully incorporate him every couple of episodes, one of his drawings. Um, so we continue to work together, and hopefully someday I'll write another one. Um, We've talked about a couple of different <coughs> ideas, so okay, I'd love to. So. Okay, and then Dean, you mentioned your your project Activate. I was wondering if you could just give people kind of the high level description of what the project's goals and ideals are, right. um, and then just where, where should people go for the hottest web comics? Uh, Activate is something that uh, was created kind of out of frustration. Uh, uh, I work on many collaborations, like with Jonathan <laughs> or Harvey Picar. I've drawn superhero f- comics, um, all that stuff. But I've always wanted to write and draw my own comics, and I had created a character called Billy Dogma, that was just kind of like my umbrella uh, avatar character that I could express certain things that I that I needed to to uh, show and tell uh, about my life or or about the things that I cared about. Anyway, I had done this character for a few years in the independent small press uh, venue, uh, and then kind of stopped doing Billy Dahmer for about four or five years because I started getting jobs drawing comic books, uh, but I was drawing them, not writing and drawing them. So eventually, uh, three years ago, uh, I had been blogging for about four or five years, and three years ago, I noticed that there were a lot of cartoonists uh, at the Live Journal Hub uh, that were also uh, either frustrated cartoonists or had been working just drawing stuff, but also liked to write and draw as well. And I contacted a few of them, and a bunch of them are my personal friends. I said, you know what? Let's let's create like a little group thing together, where once a week we put out a free strip. Uh, at this hub called, and I called it Activate because it was a cool buzzword. Uh, and we'll just give out our comics for free on the side while we're working on our paying gigs, making comics for print. Uh, also, the internet had just been coming, growing bigger and bigger, and more people were getting. I mean, every, every, I think most households have a, a computer now. I hope. Uh, I don't know what the stats are on that, but. Um, the other thing, the other side of the coin was that I was working from home a lot and uh, LiveJournal and the internet became my virtual office mates. So from emails to going on LiveJournal or blogs and kind of like parlaying with folks, it was really cool to be able to put up like not only a free comic every week, but also to show like some of the work I was doing and getting an immediate response. Often in comics or in publishing of any sort or any medium, you work on something for a long time, not in secret, but like, you know, with a few people or alone, and then eventually it comes out and you hope to get some good reviews and you show it to your friends and family and they, you hope they like it. But what was cool about the internet was the immediate response and the immediate parlays. And uh, so creating Activate allowed not only to massage the ego a little bit, but also to be a growing artist because I would learn what was working, what wasn't working with, with my sensibilities in comics. So um, I dusted off Billy Dogma revamped him for Activate and started working on that. I, I, I think the, the launch of Activate three years ago started with six or eight cartoonists, and now we have over maybe 30 now uh, hand-picked cartoonists uh, that are auteurs of the form. And um, it's been a really exciting time. Uh, other hubs have uh, been created, collectives. Uh, uh, and not that I don't think... I think DC Comics is now, uh, in the last year or so, seen uh, how great webcomics can be as well. And they, they started something called Zuda uh, that I also do another comic for uh, called Street Code, which is my semi-autobiographical story. Uh, that's something that I, I kind of stopped doing with semi autobiocomics uh, because as much as I enjoyed drawing memoir, I wanted to have a little more escapism. But it kind of drew me back in when I, uh, I pitched three ideas to, to DC Comics and they liked the memoir stuff. So I think that's what's uh, doing really well right now in the medium as well. I was just about to say something funny, like um, just one's immediate reaction. I was like, look, I was going to say to you guys, if you want to know about comics, I was going to say, Google Dean Haspiel. And, you know, because always in life you're like, oh, just Google it. 
and this is like the, such a weird place to say it. Like, you know, what I, mean? Well, I mean, you guys. I did. Anyway, I thought it was funny because, like, always in life, like, it's, it's like, true. what's going on? Oh, Google it. I mean, and then I was looking at Google, and I'm like, and then I was thinking, I got to go to Wikipedia to find out how they ever came up with this word Google, which has obviously entered the lexicon, which is amazing because it's a word that did not exist before. Mm -hmm. And now it's like a verb, a noun, an adjective or whatever. I mean, it's so many different things. I was Googled. I guess yeah. that's a... Hey, that I have adjective? a Google alert. You know? <laughs> I am Google. I don't know. Yeah, so. Google alerts. I mean, you guys have done an amazing job. It's kind of yeah. cool. Is this... Like the headquarters of Google, or is it? You know, is it one of one of the substations? Or so I feel like you know this is cool for me because I'm so bad with computers, internet. I'm on AOL. I don't know, and just losing my mind all the time. I can't get organized. Anyway, I, I like AOL. But anyway, if you want to know about comics, I really don't. But I just I don't have a feeling one way or the other. But I feel like it's so hard to switch. And I just need someone to get into my like computer and help me. But as a tangent, the thing is, Dean is like, I mean, it's cool that he called it Activate because that's what he does. I mean, he's just like, he's just such the um, cheerleader for comics and an organizer. And, you know, he just gathers people around. He creates, he's created a whole culture. It's pretty amazing. Well, so. thank you. Thanks. A progenitor, I think, is the word. Yeah, progenitor. I think cheerleader is not good. But um, <laughs> so we're nearing the end. But are there maybe one or two more questions. I don't mean to control or anything because it'd be the other night. I said I'm an out of control freak. But um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I do know we're supposed to wind up around one, and it's getting close to one. So if there's one or two more questions. Any more questions or signing or really want to... I have a question actually. There's a, a pretty famous graphic novel being released a movie next week, Watchmen. Watchmen. Um, how, what do you think of it, and what do you think about graphic novels going to movies? Hey, I'm I'm a big supporter of adaptation. Number one, okay. which is <laughs> how I see the movie going to be. I'm a big fan of Zack Snyder. I cried at 300. I think I'm the only guy who cried at a sandal and sword movie like that, but. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the comic book. Obviously, it was one of the defining moments in reading comics. I think it was the same year that Dark Knight came out, you know, Frank Miller's Dark Knight. So uh, I'm a huge fan of Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. So that comic exists already on its own. It's fantastic. Uh, I'm excited. Like, I, I cannot wait to see the movie as well. Yeah. But again, I start off by saying I'm a big fan of adaptation. I know there are naysayers out in the world, right. but you know what? Come on. You want to read the comic? It exists. You want to see the, a movie version? There's a movie, you know. Uh, I wish a lot of things would be adapted. Uh, and then what happens, and I've been getting emails from my upstairs neighbor, uh, people down the block in California. Have you read this thing called Watchmen, this comic? I'm like, yeah. Go, to, go buy it at your comic shop or go on Amazon or something. And they do, and I get emails later saying, I'm halfway through this book. It's the most amazing thing I've ever read. And, like, people are embracing comics finally, you know. I, I think comics had a real big boost in, in, the, in the, the 30s and 40s and 50s, even through the beginning of the 60s. And then, I don't know, slowly but surely, uh, it was considered some kind of bastard art form. Really, it's one of the greatest ways to, to absorb and, and get a story, uh, comics. And I think, you know, thankfully, the New York Times and the New Yorker gave it the, the nod again. And now people are, are being reintroduced to the form, and we have the backlog. We have a great catalog of all types. I mean, Jonathan earlier said that uh, he stopped reading comics at 15, girls. Uh, but I didn't stop reading comics, and there was Boys. A, boys. No. <laughs> no. Um, uh, nothing meant by that remark at all, because this guy, I mean, he nothing. He loves AOL nothing, and, <laughs> and boys. Nothing. No. I didn't mean um, anything on PC about right. that. Right. Uh, it was more that like he was. You were. What was less, it? You were less mature. That's that's all. what it was. Uh, no, but now we actually have. I think what it was was a graduation process. Meaning, you could go from reading superheroes and maybe you found an old western comic, boys, mm -hmm. uh, something mm -hmm. like that. You know that was there back when I was a kid. But now you literally have comics for all ages of all types of stories. I think in Japan they do a comic about shoes. I mean they have everything. So. Mm -hmm. It's all there, and yeah, I'm really excited to see Watchmen, and and I think it does help boost the the source material as well. 
Well, um, just to close things out, and then we can hang out a moment or two and sign books if anyone would want that. But um, I always end my performances and readings with this sound I make. It's a childhood sound called the Harry Call. Uh, it's a sound my friends and I would make on the playground when being attacked by more normal children. And it just kind of clears the air on a, on a performance and sends you off into the day. And I want to thank Google for having us. And I want to thank you guys for coming out. And um, I'll take this mic away because it would be pretty loud. I'll put it down here. Um, but I'll do three Harry calls and then send you off into your day. And thanks for working for such a cool company. So here are three Harry calls. <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry, I have a little bit of a cold. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you to Thank you, everybody. Thanks.